Hello, my name is Sue Pepin and I serve as the Director of Health and Clinical Partnerships at Arizona State University. I wanna welcome you all to the second of our four events in our Biomedical Innovation Series. I wanna thank the Arizona Biomedical Research Center for sponsoring the series and ASU Knowledge Enterprise for their work in fostering innovation through research and discovery. The structure today is gonna to include some remarks by Dr. Lee, followed by discussions. Please go ahead and start putting questions into the questions um, ability on Zoom, and we will try to get to those later. Um, so it's now my great uh, pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Vivian Lee. Dr. Lee has had an incredible and varied journey in her career. She's a physician, a healthcare executive, and the author of The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis with Strategies that Work for Everyone, which we're gonna talk about some today. She is a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School, and she is the uh, president of health platforms at Verily Life Sciences. Prior to joining Verily, Dr. Lee served as the Dean of the Medical School and the CEO of the University of Utah Healthcare, an integrated health system with a budget of over 3.6 billion, including about 1,400 member physician group and health insurance plan. Um, during her tenure in Utah, she really led to a change in healthcare delivery at the system with real innovations that enable higher quality at lower costs and with greater patient satisfaction, which we'll hear some about. She, prior to Utah, she served as the inaugural chief scientific officer at New York University's Longone Medical Center. She's elected to the National Academies of Medicine, has over 200 peer reviewed publications. I could go on quite a bit, but with no further ado, welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Sue. It's a wonderful, really wonderful to be with you. And um, for those of you who have known Dr. Pepin for a long time, you will share my admiration for her. Uh, and you, you may not know um, that actually, I think we've known each other for a long time now. I don't know if I really want to share how many years, but it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, and it's just so wonderful to, to be able to be with you um, today. And thank you for inviting me. Um, as, as you mentioned, as I am on this uh, virtual book tour, and I've really enjoyed uh, the opportunity to uh, talk with people from all over the country, whether it was in you know, Grand Browns or speaking like this in a university setting or with medical students or in the community. Um, and it's by talking about the book and by having discussions like this, I, it really gives me a chance to reflect more and particularly um, get a sense of your thinking about healthcare. And so I'm really looking forward to the discussion um, with Sue and with all of you. In the, in the Q&A today. I was particularly drawn to writing this book, and, and I'll just show it to you. Um, I was really drawn to it because I, I found this issue of our healthcare system in the country to be just a really fascinating question, a really um, a real paradox, uh, I think, of our times. And I think as, as most of you know, um, and I wish we were in person because it's just so much more fun to actually see people and, and have that engagement. Um, but hopefully we can do more in the soon. But as most of you, I think, know, um, the real paradox of healthcare in this country is that we are just spending so much money on healthcare. In this country, uh, per person, we spend around two, two and a half, or even three times as much per person per year than other high income countries. And so you'd expect us to be two, three times better, but in fact, actually our performance always comes in among the lowest of other high income countries. And that can be measured in many different ways um, from uh, everything from infant mortality or maternal mortality to life expectancy. So for example, the average baby born today in the US is projected to live four, five, or even six years less than the average baby, for example, born in Italy or in Israel or in Australia or Japan. And so unlike 
many of the other really challenging problems that we face in this country, like poverty and education, you know, there's where we are significantly under-resourced. You know, there's really a major issue with the fact that we just don't have enough resources for those um, problems. In healthcare, it's really the opposite. It's not that we're not spending enough, we're actually spending too much. And what the ultimate irony is that many of the people who you would think would be benefiting, you know, the, the physicians, for example, hospital administrators, um, they should be really, you'd think they'd be happy because somehow all this money is pouring in. But in fact, they're actually among the most frustrated and the most burnt out uh, of, of the professionals. And so I think what we can conclude is that our industry, our business, unlike most other industries, just isn't really working efficiently. It's really, we're not getting the market efficiencies that we would expect, where innovation and competition and capitalism would be driving to better and better outcomes at lower and lower costs. Somehow it's just not working for healthcare. And that's the trying to understand why that is, um, is one of the main reasons why I wrote this book. I actually really wrote it for our medical students because I was trying to explain to them what was happening in healthcare in this country because I feel that the, the future is in their hands. And so I wanted them to be a little more equipped than I felt like I was when I came out of medical school and residency. Um, and, and the good news is that um, the solutions for how we can get to a better, more efficient and more effective healthcare system um, I think the ideas there are actually pretty well defined among the people who have been thinking about this for a long time. And kind of remarkably, especially in, in this week, um, I would say that there's actually bipartisan support and a very much a shared vision for the way forward in healthcare, really moving away from a fee-for-service model to a model where we are paying for better health. In fact, when I interviewed people for the book, I interviewed about 100 over 100 people in the course of writing this book, and you know, people who have come from all different walks of life in healthcare. Um, and I asked them, what's the one thing, if you could just wave your magic wand and fix one thing in healthcare, what would that be? And the vast majority of them said uh, what I just shared with you, which is the business model. They would change the business model, and that was the most important leverage. So um, what I then, um, spent a lot of time thinking about in the course of my career and then in, in my year sabbatical when I was working on this book was, well, what are better models that could work in this country? And what are examples in, that are already, have already been going on that already have good data of successes? And how can we weave together the stories of those successes into a coherent national strategy? And do it in a way that actually addresses each of our individual roles and responsibilities, whether we are patients, whether we're clinicians, you know, hospital administrator type people, um, uh, or policymakers, for example, or payers. So that's really uh, what, what the story is about. And I thought what I would do is read just one, just a segment of the book, just one a page or two, um, that maybe gives an example of new ways of thinking about practicing medicine and um, have maybe some of the lessons that we can draw and also uh, what's happened during COVID actually with those. So I'm gonna find this page. I'm gonna read a, um, a short section from er a big early part of the book. It's in chapter two. This chapter is called An Apple a Day Keeps the Patient Away. And it's about a, my interview, my conversation with a, a guy named Chris Chen in Miami starts like this with a quote. Go see that crazy Chinese doctor who takes care of all the poor Cubans. Chris Chen grins as he tells me how people used to rave about his father's clinic in Miami. His father had started as a typical primary care doctor in private practice. He was paid fee for service, which meant the more patients he saw, the more he earned. Then in South Florida in the early 1990s, a few insurance companies started experimenting with new ways to pay doctors. Instead of fee for service, they gave them a fixed amount per patient per year. If a patient needed expensive imaging, costly drugs, or long hospitalizations that added up to more than that amount, it was the doctor's problem. Chris's dad, the doctor, and his mom, the office manager, experimented in this new model. They welcomed referrals, 
but other doctors sent them only their frailest and poorest patients, the ones they knew would be grossly unprofitable under this new way of caring. That's how Chris's parents began with 250 of the sickest people in Miami. People who would have been almost impossible to keep well at any facility at any place. It looked as if the Chans had signed up for a financial suicide mission. Because resources were scarce and their patients' needs were many, the Chans decided to focus on primary care and prevention. Their fragile elderly patients had to be seen frequently by doctors. Once they got sick, it would be too late. So they set up monthly visits, even if there was nothing wrong. Getting to the clinic would be tough for many of them. So the Chans provided free door-to-door -door transportation. They worked out that averting the cost of just one ambulance ride and hospital stay could pay for a year of shuttle service. They opened a pharmacy in the clinic so their patients could conveniently, cheaply, and reliably fill prescriptions. And since their patients often had complex needs, physicians in the clinics conferred several times a week about how best to treat those who weren't doing well. Somehow that crazy Chinese doctor and his wife not only provided outstanding care for their patients, including many who often didn't have enough to cover co-pays or deductibles, but they also managed to make them healthier. They reduced hospitalizations, and even more amazingly, they broke even financially. Out of desperation, the Chen's invented a better way to do so. This model that I describe um, that Chris Chen's family developed has evolved into a business called Chen Med, and Chris Chen is the CEO of that business. And it's now, um, the program that is run by Medicare called Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage is now covering about one third of all seniors and it's expected to grow to as many as 50% uh, by 2025. And it's an example of how changing the payment model from what traditional Medicare does, which is fee for service, which is you know the model where every time a patient comes in, you have to do something to them in order to bill Medicare for that visit. And that's what's led to these very um, rushed visits with many procedures often associated with them. Medicare Advantage by changing that model, by paying the physicians a fixed amount of money and then giving them the autonomy and the latitude to decide how to spend those dollars has really radically changed the way in which they run the business as you can see. And Chen Min is just one of many, many organizations um, that are now taking off the the country. So that uh, was an example that I wanted to share of how moving from a fever service model to paying for better health can not only um, do good, but be, as a business model, it can also be a very successful model. And in, in the rest, in much of the rest of the book, the while in this example, I'm talking about care for seniors, which is very, very important, um, and really focusing here on keeping them out of the hospital, in other parts of the book, I talk about examples of what the same change in mindset, paying for better health, what that would look like for hospital-based care, and what that would look like if we held the pharmaceutical industry and other industries like the big data industries accountable for delivering better health outcomes instead of thinking in a fee-for-service world. And then um, later in the book, I also take the perspective of the payers. What, how should payers, people who are paying for healthcare, be doing things differently if they were really expecting more of a, a model of better outcomes. And particularly, I focus on employers who cover healthcare for about half of all Americans. And then a government-based system, I actually look at the military health system and the VA, which I think offer really fascinating outcomes. And then finally, wrap, wrap all of that up at the end of the book with some policy lessons. So um, I'm, I'm happy to maybe now uh, turn the podium or would <laughs> turn this back over to you um, and happy to have more of a conversation too. Like well, thank you. And um, there's so much we could talk about. We, we, need a, we need a full day. What I find really powerful about the book and, and, and you being a really good person to write this book is because you've practiced in medicine, you've been, a, you know, the chief scientific officer, uh, overseeing research and discovery. You've been in leadership roles of education and future workforce, but also in, you know, of a, of a healthcare system. 
which branches, of course, well beyond medicine or you know, the doctors, but all of the allied health surrounding that. And now you're in technology. And just like healthcare, it needs all those components to work together to, to move in a direction that is increasing access, better outcomes and reducing costs. So I'd love to hear, because you've, you've played roles and have experience in all those, all those places. Tell us a bit about you and what drives you and, and how has your drive evolved, so to speak, in the span of your work? Well, you know, while I have been in the technology space now for two years, of course, I've spent my whole life in university settings. So where you know, most of your audience is um, rooted. So I, I will start there by saying that I think that um, maybe I'll tell you a, a little story about how I ended up getting into healthcare administration and even thinking about the job in Utah. And it, it came from this um, visit that I made when I was the chief scientific officer at NYU. I went up to the Mass General to visit an old friend, um, Greg Myers, who you also know, I'm sure, uh, who uh, was at the Mass General. And I was actually doing a field trip to learn more about how their uh, research administration works, since I was just um, new at this job in, in NYU, and I wanted to learn more about it from them. They were really very generous about that. And at the same time during that visit, uh, Greg, who was responsible for safety, quality and safety at the Mass General at the time, um, pulled me aside and he was just showing me some of the work that he was doing. And I had kind of an epiphany when he was taking me through this because what he shared with me was they had built their own homegrown electronic medical record system. And of course, they were only able to do that because they were in this very rich academic environment with people who had expertise in biomedical informatics and data. And, and so they could actually conceive of building their own EHR. And then from having built that EHR, they decided, I don't know who actually had the idea, but he did they decided that they would start negotiating with the state of Massachusetts to be paid differently. So until then, they had been paid fee for service and every time somebody came in, they got, they, they built the state and they got paid. And instead he said, we thought we should be getting paid for improving health outcomes. And so we negotiated with the state to say that if we were able to improve the blood pressure of our patients by a certain amount on average overall, that we would get a bonus from that. And because they had this EHR, they actually had data about how they were doing, and they had reasonable access to those patients to be able to intervene. And so they had some sense of where they could probably move the dial. And so they really opened up this entirely new way of contracting the state and pushed, I think, the whole field forward into a more of a pay for performance model there. And because they had their EHR and all these really brilliant data science type people and, and wonderful clinicians. Um, they were actually able to meet and even exceed those expectations. So they did well financially for the hospital as well. And it was that point when I thought, you know, why aren't more academic medical centers leading in this kind of healthcare transformation? We have incredibly talented people across all of the areas of expertise. We, we have kind of our own built-in consulting teams. When I was at the University of Utah, we really wanted to move through this whole lean Six Sigma kind of training program. We, being a state institution, could not really afford the big consultants, you know, a bazillion dollars an hour. And so instead we reached out to our business school where we happened to have some outstanding faculty and operations with graduate students who wanted to write papers about us. And so they came in and they served as essentially consultants to us. So I think they're just, that those, it's the intersections of these different areas of expertise that universities happen to be really concentrated in, which I think makes them incredibly exciting places for innovation in any space, but especially, especially in healthcare. Yeah. You know, part of the inspiration for this speaker series was using the lens of Phoenix as a location that is an up and coming biotech center. And that cross between you know, universities, um, industry, the city, but also arts and culture and living spaces and, and, and you know, thriving cultural events and residencies. We have this area 
in Phoenix right now, we're calling it the Phoenix Biomedical Area. Um, talk to us about what your work was like in Utah. I know you had a similar experience and in, in, while CEO of the hospital system and, and Dean of the Medical School. Sure, uh, that's, you know, Phoenix is a beautiful place and uh, it's so nice. Um, so, uh, and there are so many things to do there. So I think this idea of the strategy is a good one. So Salt Lake City also had its own attractions which I hadn't fully appreciated until I moved there. So, um, so you want to take, take the most advantage of them if you can. We had some really interesting innovations that took place as a result of both what was possible within our academic uh, entities, as well as in partnership with uh, the community. So maybe I, I can give you um, an example of each. So um, we had, so at the University of Utah, we have a, an integrated health sciences campus. So it included the School of Medicine, um, as well as pharmacy, nursing, a college of health, which was essentially a college of outside health with EPOT, speech therapy, nutrition, um, and so on. And then we actually started a brand new dental school while I was there, which was actually really fascinating. Um, plus, of course, the healthcare delivery system. So it was when we got together, there was a lot of, um, we put a lot of energy into thinking about how can these different teams learn from each other? We had all kinds of really interesting retreats and offsites and that kind of thing. One of, uh, one of my favorite projects that I learned about in that um, early days was a project that had been funded by the NIH. It was a big program project grant to the College of Nursing to help um, monitor cancer patients uh, who were going home, discharged home, and to prevent readmissions. And it was a very simple program when it started. It was simply the, the nurses would call the patients or call their caregivers at home once they got there and to check on them every day. Um, actually, it was automated uh, now that I think about it. it. It wasn't even a person, but it was one of those, press one if you're feeling good, press two if you have an issue. So it was pretty low tech, right? This started, this started maybe 20 years ago. And, um, but it had a huge impact. It actually significantly um, lowered readmissions because it detected, you know, when people were starting to feel a little nauseated, you know, before they get completely dehydrated. And, um, also, it turns out that it was very positive for the caregivers, just that know that somebody was checking in on them and if something was going wrong, that they could actually, that there would be somebody that would be following. When we first learned about that project, you know, it was just academically interesting that we had that. But then, of course, we connected them with other parts of the system. We actually, over time, partnered them with the video gaming folks who could write apps and make it just more digitized rather than um, voice. And then it even led to some really interesting work uh, within the system on hospital home and building out kind of a more of an intensive home-based uh, experience. So that was an example of within the university. And then the university to the community was also very important, which sounds like it could be an opportunity for you as well. You know, in, in Utah, now it's really it's grown into this Silicon Slopes idea, a lot of work with um, tech companies, as well as with the community. And one of the areas that was a high priority for the community was increasing access to rehab facilities. We just didn't have enough rehab facilities. And so we actually had some folks in the community, including donors who stepped up and said, you know, we really wanna build a new rehab facility, maybe. And how can you really make this a compelling, compelling case for why it should be done at the university as opposed to somewhere else? And actually it was our, one of the really compelling arguments that we were able to make was our video gaming team who came out of the College of Engineering and Computer Science and Media Arts. So this is a very much a main campus group. And they came in and they really um, inspired everybody with these ideas about how video gaming, for example, you know, you're a post stroke patient and uh, there were these video games where, you know, there was a, uh, let's see, it's a farmer and these animals are trying to eat your vegetables and you have to swat away these animals or whatever. And with your, your Wii stick or whatever your video gaming um, devices are, those could actually be used to not only measure, but also interact with the video games so that you were doing the right kind of physical therapy that was necessary. You know, right. The rabbit was stealing your rabbit, uh, your carrots from the right 
coming from the right angles so that you would have to do the right exercise. That vision of bringing video gaming into rehab was what I think tipped us over to be able to um, actually get the support that we needed. It was one of many factors, but it was a very important one, of course, in the and getting a new rehab hospital. So I think there are a lot of opportunities that those yeah. initiatives have. Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I don't want to miss the fact that your background, your PhD is in medical engineering. Um, and that's really uh, was a foundation for you. That we, so many of our efforts at the universities are connecting, you know, biology with engineering, healthcare and engineering and the solutions that connecting engineers to clinicians can be developed and that sort of ramps out to industry and startups. But can you talk to us about your experience now that too, well, I'll attach that to what you're learning at Verily. So Verily, uh, I'll tell you all a little bit about Verily. I, I don't, normally I would ask for a show of hands. I don't know how to do that here unless you wanna type it in the chat box. If you know anything about Verily, I'm curious because we've had a pretty uh, low key um, approach generally. So Verily, uh, for those of you who don't know too much about us, is a company that uh, was originally called Google Life Sciences. It's a part of the Alphabet family. And um, when Google became Alphabet, we were one of the bets that was spun out. And then we were rebranded from Google Life Sciences to do Verily. And we were purpose-built to commercialize life sciences and now healthcare products. And so I joined uh, two and a half years ago to really lead the healthcare side of it, uh, which is called Health Care Science. So um, what I find, in, and maybe I, I'll just say a word about why I decided to do this, because I, I had really been planning on staying within healthcare, and I was actually getting ready to go and lead another healthcare system. Um, I was actually very excited about this new system. When, uh, when I had a follow another conversation again with Verily, and it actually, it comes back to this book because um, when I was talking with the CEO about why he really should find someone else, because I just, okay, just to give you a sense of it, I still had, until six months ago, I still had my Blackberry. So just to give you a sense of where I am on the tech spectrum. Um, but the reason, you know, he came, when he came back and talked to me about why I should think about doing it, he just said, you know, you should just come and do your book. Your book is supposed to be about fixing healthcare. And that's what we want to do here, except that if you go to a health system, if you're lucky, maybe you'll help improve that one health system in that community. But what we're trying to do is really do things at scale. And that's actually, I, I found that really fascinating, that idea. And so that's what convinced me, I guess, to, to, to have a go with this technology side. And in terms of what I've really discovered, what the realization now that I am in this company, and it, I can't speak for all of technology, obviously I can only speak for my little experience here, is that the technology is one piece of what is really, um, I think, interesting. We are seeing it a lot. For example, we can talk more about telehealth and digital health solutions. Um, but the other piece that I find really fascinating in this company is the mindset about how the company thinks about people thinks about patients, thinks about physicians, thinks about you know, pharmacists, you know, the people that we work with, um, in the sense that it, it's really a company that um, is a consumer-based company. And uh, I think embraces this idea. I have this, there's this idea that I talk a little bit about in the book uh, called co-producing health, that as healthcare providers, I think traditionally we've often thought about healthcare as as like something that we kind of control and we'll work with you and we'll help you, but we're the ones that give you your health, you know, like in the, in the hospital, in the intensive care, you know, we restore you to health maybe. But I think for most of healthcare and most of ambulatory care, certainly, it's really co-production. It's really, we help patients produce their own health. And that mindset is very much how the folks in technology think about consumers, at least you know, at least the folks like the ones that I work with who are looking at, um, you know, uh, software and apps and internet. And what it leads to is a very different way of interacting with people. So the way in which we build our products, 
the user experience researchers, the user experience designers, these are really behavioral psychologists. The ways in which they think about how we interact with people to help them achieve the better health um, and understand what's important to them and what are priorities to them, rather than I'd say a more traditional healthcare view, which is we know what's best. We're gonna just tell you like stop making exercise, et cetera. And we know that generally that doesn't, doesn't work that effectively. So I think what, what's been interesting to me is the combination of data and technology with these insights about how people actually, how to actually think and how to motivate them. Sure. And we're starting to get some really, really thoughtful questions and I wanna to try to combine them in the areas that I wanna cover. You know, with the, to follow up on that, with the increased use of, of telemedicine and digital health, Obviously, there's been an increased focus on remote monitoring and home care for people, particularly with chronic medical conditions and high-risk preg pregnancy patients, um, in addition to even acute care. How are outcomes being evaluated, and do you see those metrics being utilized in addition to being baked into a value-based care model? Great question. Really great and very important question, because I think we're at the cost of digital health really uh, moving into more of the mainstream of healthcare. And so these questions of how are we measuring outcomes? How are we making sure that we um, think about digital health as a value tool, as a, you know, as a set of tools that really drive better health outcomes rather than as devices where we just charge per click, for example. You know, this is a really, really important set of questions. So, um, We've been thinking about it a lot here. Now I'm going to maybe just shift, uh, just wear my Verily hat for a few minutes just to say about the, um, the experience that we've been having with respect to the digital technologies that we are actually in the market with. And um, we have a product uh, which is called Onduo, which is a digital health solution that started in type 2 diabetes and now includes other conditions like hypertension and mental well-being. And I, I will say, you know, and I'm not trying to advocate for it. There are other products very similar on the market, like um, Omada, Verda, Livongo. So we're one of, of these. We were, what differentiated us in the beginning was we were one of the earliest to have a continuous glucose monitor as part of the technology. And now many of the others also have it. Um, and just for those of you who maybe don't know much about the space, I'll just explain it to you very briefly kind of how these technologies generally work um, and then say something about these metrics because I think it's a really important question. But just so you know what we're talking about, um, ordinarily at this point, I would ask you for a show of hands, like how many of you actually have tried a digital health solution uh, or, a, or a wellness app? Because I, I try to encourage everyone to try one, you know, even if it's one of these meditation, mindfulness, whatever, just try it. Because I think that we are, as I said, we're on the cusp and pretty soon I think these are gonna become things that people just prescribe and order. And so it's important to have a sense of what they're about. For the diabetes space or hypertension, this kind of chronic disease space, um, the diabetes is a good example because it includes a new sensor. So this continuous glucose monitor technology and there are multiple vendors of these technologies and, and they all do essentially the same thing, which is they're kind of the size of a key fob say like, like maybe about this size and you put it on your arm or your abdomen and it automatically measures your blood sugars for a couple of weeks. So instead of pricking your finger to draw the drop of blood and checking your blood sugar, you stick one of these things on and there's a Bluetooth chip in it and it transmits your blood sugars to your app, say on your phone. And then you take pictures of your meals and snacks because your diet is so important in terms of your blood sugars. And so you can now visually associate what you've eaten uh, with how your blood sugars are tracing up and down. And of course, also with your exercise and also how you're sleeping. And so it's just transformative in terms of people's understanding of their own biology. And what we're seeing pretty clearly is that everyone's biology differs significantly. So if we ate the same meal, for example, our blood sugars would respond uh, very differently. There's um, that first, just your own insight and your own learning and awareness. And then that's enhanced with some AI so we can see patterns, we can make meal recommendations, we can say, well, for you, Sue, you know, maybe uh, we noticed soy milk, you were doing way better with soy milk than skim milk, whereas Vivian, you know, skim, stick to skim, that's better for you. Um, those kinds of observations are, are actually can be very helpful. 
And then there's the telehealth piece. So uh, chatting with a coach or video conferencing with a physician, for example, and having that, you know, that professional interaction um, is, is really important. So when you take that all together, what you see pretty consistently across the literature in, in across these very products is they work. They really do improve people's blood sugar control. And it's not surprising when you see them working, it's really not surprising at all that they're actually working. People are really working. Um, what's interesting about this, now getting back to your specific question, is how do we um, how do we actually think about these not only as disruptive or innovative models in the way in which we care for people, but also innovative in the way in which we think about the business of healthcare. And I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm now responsible for this company. And we started last year just changing the way in which we were paid. So ordinarily, we would be paid a per member per month. You know, we, we get paid for as many people as we can get to sign up for this thing. It doesn't really matter. Ordinarily, it doesn't matter whether you make them better or not. You just get paid if they sign up. But we decided to do it differently and say, you know what, we only, we're going to go 100% at risk. We're only going to get paid if people's blood sugars actually come down. If, if they're high, if they're, if they're good, then they need to stay good. Um, and we look also at cost of care. We're looking at a, you know, some other metrics that are, that are considered important. Um, and I think that that, I'm actually really excited about it. It's a little risky. So ask me in a year or two how we did. <laughs> I don't know. Um, we have some data, you know, we have some, we're sort of optimistic about it, of course. Um, but I think it's an example of uh, trying to hold digital technologies accountable for actually delivering on better health outcomes. And I hope that payers will uh, adopt this, this kind of approach because the last thing we need to do is sort of recapitulate fee for service in digital health. This is an opportunity for us to, to move forward and move beyond that. To shift the paradigm and, and use a, a model for outcomes, not just action fee for service. That's fabulous. Yeah. Let's go a little deeper on healthcare costs. I, I, you know, Americans sort of have this idea that their health care should be paid for. And the costs are often covered by about 50% um, by employers or by Medicare. Um, but the reality is we're really all paying for health care, both individually and across the uh, society. And over the last five decades, as you as have already mentioned, we've been paying more and more. And about 8% of that goes to administration of health care. And while a fifth of our GDP is spent on healthcare, we have incredible health disparities in this country. I'd love to hear your thoughts on some solutions in that space. Yeah, so that's really the, the, the pressing issue for us now, especially COVID, post COVID and the economic impact that COVID is having on this country, um, the widening disparities uh, because of the way in which COVID is affecting our communities. It, it's becoming, we really are, um, we really are in that crisis mode where we need to really figure out how to start changing things very quickly now. Um, and the opportunities that you, that you just alluded to, Sue, are, are huge because we are outspending any other um, high income nation in terms of how much we're putting into healthcare, 18% of our GDP, that's far more than most other countries. So it's not an issue of finding more money, it's figuring out how do we reduce the waste or improve the efficiency. And one of them is really through uh, reducing administrative costs. And I think that the, the I'll, I'll give you, now this is a little bit, so for those of you who are not super into health policy, I'm, I'll only dip into this very briefly because it's a little bit of a, of, of a policy um, wonkish kind of a topic. But what happens every year in, in healthcare is what I call the trillion dollar tug of war. And what I mean by that is every year, as employees and our employers, we pay our premiums to, for our health insurance into um, you know, to health insurance companies or, or third-party administrators. And so there's this big pool of money, it's like a trillion dollars. And during the course of the year, there's this tug of war between the insurance companies or administrators or employers who wanna hold on to the money, mostly through these you know, insurance companies, and then the uh, healthcare delivery systems who want to keep billing and charging so that they can stay alive. And so they want to bill, bill, bill so they can collect that money. And the back and forth fight between the payers and the providers uh, is a significant driver in these administrative costs. Because you know every time you have um, denials and then you have to make the claims or you have these 
barriers um, where the providers actually have to uh, fill out all the sort of extra paperwork just to justify getting an MRI, for example, or getting a referral. All of those lead to an enormous amount of waste. And it, uh, it is about 8% of the healthcare dollar, which um, is significantly more. So most of the European countries, OECD nations, it's about 3%. So this is a lot of money that we're wasting. And the problem with that waste is it's really what's making physicians miserable, in large part contributing to the physician burnout. And when we can't resolve that tug of war, it falls to the patient. And that's how we end up with these surprise bills and balance bills that, um, that are leading to so much uh, suffering and so many people and even bankruptcy. So one direction forward is if we go back to the way in which I was talking about how Medicare Advantage is paying for healthcare. So Medicare Advantage, in theory, the idea is they pay a fixed amount of money to these medical groups for the year. And, and then it's really up to the medical groups to keep people healthy. They have to meet certain quality metrics and patients have to be satisfied because if they're not, they don't have to renew after a year. Um, and so in theory, in that model, there really shouldn't be the need to do all this coding and billing and kind of, you know, excesses in my view of documentation. Um, they still have it in there now because it's sort of residual from Medicare generally how it's administered. But imagine if we really move to that model, um, it shouldn't be necessary to do a lot of that uh, administrative uh, paperwork. And there won't be that fight because for once in that Medicare Advantage model, both Medicare and the administrator, you know, the, the insurance companies that are administering it, and the doctors are all aligned. Everybody wants these patients to be healthier, stay out of the hospital if they can, and get their costs down. Um, so everybody's on the same page. So there's a lot less that'll be squandered in, in fighting. That's just one example. In, in the book, I talk a lot about other areas of waste, uh, about cost how we actually can get costs down in terms of thinking about care. I talk a lot about safety. Medical mistakes are very costly, not only financially, but of course, massive suffering that's completely unnecessary. Um, so there are many other, many other examples too, as you know. Um, but administration is one of those where I don't think anybody would argue in defense of more administration. You know? <laughs> I think we could all be very joyful if we could reduce that. Yeah, and yet we are still where we're at. You know, in chapter 12 in your book, you start out with a quote from Vice Admiral Raquel Bobo, which reads, we should be targeting the readiness of all our citizens to do what they're supposed to do in support of our society. You know, healthcare should not be partisan because everyone has a stake in health, and yet it has become. You talk to us about healthcare as a problem with bipartisan solutions. I'd be happy to do that. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is so interesting about the healthcare problem is that it, I do believe that there is an enormous amount of bipartisan support for many of the uh, changes that need to take place. And the most um, obvious example is the move in the payment model. So the, the payment model moved from uh, a fee-for-service model to more of a value-based payment model. Has that, that idea has been around for a while. Um, Many of the ideas that were originally in Romney care were adapted into Obamacare and are now continued to be moved forward under Secretary Azar and Sina Burma. Um, one of the uh, individuals who influenced this book a lot was Mike Levitt. Mike Levitt was the Secretary for Health and Human Services under Bush. He was a governor of Utah, uh, three term. And Secretary Azar was actually his deputy secretary. Um, back in the day. And it's like, he's actually the reason why this book is called The Long Fix, because he's the one that actually planted this idea that these, these changes, the evolutions, take about 40 years. And he, he um, convinced me that we're, we were, before COVID, about halfway through one of these 40-year cycles. And so, uh, you know, there's a long fix, although I hope hopefully it's going to be a little shorter now. Um, so the, the the arguments for changing the payment model have been there across administrations. And even now, um, despite all of the rhetoric around you know, many other issues in this country, um, the health policy community, health administrator community is, 
I think, stronger than ever with the urgency of moving to more of a value-based payment model. Um, I actually, one, one of the lessons from COVID is just the fact that these more value-based models are actually also more resilient in the face of the pandemic. So I caught up with some of these folks like the Chen Meds and Iora Health and Presby, several of the groups that um, have that same model. I caught up with them during COVID and I said, you know, how are you guys doing now through this pandemic? And actually it's, it's proven really uh, much more robust. So for example, in a fee-for-service model, once the clinics shut down with COVID in, in April, March, April, May, you know, we were hearing about hospitals teetering on bankruptcy and furloughing. I think in, in April, we furloughed almost one and a half million doctors and nurses in this country. It was sort of unimaginable. Um, these folks, the Medicare Advantage type programs, continue to get their monthly payments from Medicare because of their business model. They're not counting on, you know, every patient has to come in and then I got a bill for that. They have what Chris Chen calls a subscription model. It's like, um, as opposed to a pay as you go, you know, they have the subscription. They are already guaranteed monthly payments for Medicare. And they were able to use those dollars to be much more proactive about caring for their patients, whether it's providing more care in the home setting. Um, the folks at Presby were telling me about how they were able to manage a lot of patients with mild COVID, even in the home setting with an oximeter and a thermometer and, and regular checkups. Um, they delivered medications to their homes. They converted their clinics into urgent care centers so that their seniors didn't have to go to the ER. So not only did they not have to throw up people, but they were able to use the, those, you know, the income from Medicare in order to actually provide better care for their, for their patients. And so that's yet another reason why I think there's a lot of support uh, for moving to this model. And the hospitals that are paid in this way, like the military health system or the VA health system, also did much better than um, the hospitals that are living fee for service um, throughout this pandemic. So for the first time, I've actually heard the American Hospital Association saying, oh yes, we would actually welcome discussions about more global payments or capitated payment models, more of these different kinds of models than I've ever heard in the past. So I think there's a lot of momentum and the fact that the economy has taken such a hit with COVID creates even more urgency around that move. Yeah. Yeah, I want to follow up on two points there. One a question from, from our participants related to, you know, bipartisan needs. Um, why do you think the Democrats in Congress support ACOs to control spending and Republicans support Medicare Advantage programs? And both are really quite similar in philosophy, yet they cannot agree on a compromise model. Isn't there a way to get what you suggest that could be bipartisan. Yeah, I think there's going to be a, um, you know, I, I will be the first to say that none of these programs are perfect. You know, although I, I think Medicare Advantage is much better than a fee-for-service Medicare program, I think we were, we're learning a lot about how that program can continue to be improved. And uh, the same thing is, of course, true with ACOs you know, from the beginning. Um, I think that what we are seeing out, you know, within the, within the um, agencies themselves, the people who are, uh, who have been working in the space for a long time are, are building on those lessons and continuing to refine how the programs are, um, are developed in order to kind of make the programs better. What I'm hoping will happen in the next year is, uh, an acceleration of that tweaking, because I think the tweaking um, has been very slow and very incremental, but the need to really change our healthcare system has become much more urgent, much more pressing. The, the Congressional Budget Office just announced last month a revision in their projections around the insolvency of the Medicare Trust Fund Part A, which is the part that pays for hospitals. Originally, it was slated, you know, there, so that's the money, you know, comes from our taxes and then is used to pay hospitals for Medicare patients. And it was originally going to run out around 2026, 2027, and the revisions show that it's going to run out by 2024. So, of course, it won't, it won't run out. We, you know, Congress will figure something out, but the urgency of figuring out how can we be even more aggressive about the way in which we make these payment models, I think, um, I think it's going to happen. And I'm not, uh, I'm not particularly, you know, the Medicare Advantage, well, we can learn some of the, 
we can learn a lot from what's worked for seniors. We can learn about what's worked for ACOs. I think people have already been learning about this, of course, a lot. And then we can start to really share those and kind of take the next generation forward. Yeah. And I think that's probably what's going to happen. I also want to follow up on another point. You know, you wrote this book and it came out in early summer, so it would, would have been would have been done with it before the pandemic um, at least took hold, uh, maybe not before it started. Um, and, and it sounds like really it's reinforced a lot of, of your um, thinking in the book. Um, but certainly what a stress test this pandemic has been on our healthcare system to say the least. Has your thinking shifted in the last six to seven months with COVID? Well, I think it's, it has definitely highlighted some areas that I did not focus on that much in the book. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't changed much of the underlying thinking, because as we've just said, I think it's just made it even more apparent that we need to move away from certain models to other models. But areas that I didn't, hadn't thought much about or hadn't written much about, even if I had thought about them, became even more um, even more obvious during the pandemic and are actually things that I'm writing about now for the epilogue. So I've been asked to write an epilogue for the paperback version. And, um, you know, since, as you said, this, this book doesn't talk about COVID, the epilogue will talk a little bit about the post-COVID situation. And, and here I'm focusing on um, areas like uh, thinking a little bit about nursing homes and long-term care. And what are we doing in this country to address um, care for our frail elderly who aren't able to live at home? Then the fact that nursing homes were hit so badly, I think maybe about 40% of all COVID deaths have taken place in nursing homes, even though only about 7% of cases have happened there. I think that's really uh, worthy of, of a lot of attention. I've been thinking a lot about the rural communities and rural medicine. Um, and then I've been thinking a lot about health disparities, of course, and um, reflecting on um, how those disparities are exacerbated, not only by COVID, but also by the way in which the economic impact of COVID is, is affecting the country. It's not affecting the local level. And what can, we, what can we do about that? And so I think there are new areas to, to think about as well, or new areas to discuss certainly in the book. Many of us have been thinking about for a while, but COVID has shown even brighter and even harsher light. Um, but I think they, many of them still come back to the same themes, which are that um, you know, the health of our country, it's in fact the quote that you read from Admiral Bono, you know, health is essential. It, it's essential to the readiness of our country, not just the readiness of our military to defend our country, but the readiness of all of our citizens to, to act in whatever roles they're acting, whether they're teachers or firefighters or the local grocery store owner. Um, and we can see that so clearly now. And so if we don't, uh, you know, we, we just absolutely must think about the health of our population as a strategic imperative for this country. And it's not just a financial item. It's really um, the health that we are primarily looking for. And that, that's why one of the areas that I talk about at the end of the book is really how would we think about the government's responsibility for health? Would we think about it primarily as a, like a benefits program that has to simply pay for health care? Or do we really want a government entity that is responsible for improving the health of our population? And really measured against that. And obviously you can tell by the way I'm speaking, it needs to be both, um, but we really do primarily need to focus on better health outcomes for this country. Yeah, COVID really hammers that home. Mm -hmm. I want to get to a, one or two more. We have some really um, good questions from our participants. One is there are many pockets of good practice in the U.S. and elsewhere. But to an outsider, the strong cultural attachment to individuality in the US militates strongly against the more collective approach that is needed to underpin a focused approach on population health and health care. You talk to us about you, what you see as a political route to reform. 
Well, one of the, that, that's an interesting, um, there's a lot in that to unpack. I, I think I would be a little bit more generous. I do feel that Americans are, are very individualistic. That's true. But I think Americans also care a lot about their communities, their families, and their communities. And um, one of the disconnects uh, that I see in, in the way in which we do think about healthcare is this idea that uh, someone else is paying. And, um, and as you, I think, alluded to earlier, Sue, one of the points that I make is that actually we are all paying for healthcare. If you think it's, oh, it's my employer's paying or my insurance company is paying, so I'll just go and you know, bring my kid to the emergency room because I'm not the one paying, then you are pretty, pretty sorely mistaken. We're paying for it not once, not twice, but actually three times. We pay for it um, out of our taxes, obviously, as I mentioned, Medicare or, or state taxes and federal taxes we're paying for health care for the country. We're also paying for it in terms of um, out-of-pocket costs now. Those have actually risen. Those of us who are fortunate enough to have health care through our employers, our actual um, contribution to that has increased to uh, over 30%. We are actually now paying for ourselves. Yes. And then, of course, the, the most insidious um, has been the fact that it's actually coming out of our wages. So over the last 50 to 60 years, while the economy has grown, our wages should be growing. Our wages have essentially been flat. And the reason they've been flat is because the whole delta has been gone, gone to pay for our health care. And even some of our retirement monies now are actually being siphoned off and, and gone to pay for health care. So while you may not think that that extra visit or that extra MRI that maybe you don't really need um, you're not paying for it in the end. It's, it is coming out of all of our paychecks. Maybe not today, but next year's paycheck. Um, exactly. And I think we need to all recognize that we have a collective individual responsibility for, um, for managing our own health, like just in terms of looking after our health, but also um, making sure that we recognize that more isn't always better. You know, you don't always need the extra prescription or the just in case scan or whatever it is. Uh, we're we're all paying for those, and they're not they're not free. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dr. Lee, we are so appreciative of the time you've taken uh, to share with this community in Arizona and and beyond. Um, what I find your book is really important, and what I really really resonated is lays out what each and every one of us can do, and and that is so important that we all have responsibility in this and it takes you know multiple sectors but it really takes all of us so i would just ask in closing what's your final message for us oh well i think your the final message is um i guess probably what i just said earlier which is that we all have our own role to play in this um I, what i alluded to earlier was our role as individuals as patients and as family members to be accountable and responsible for our own health but i know in this audience there are many of you who are um, in healthcare or in research or in, in education. Um, and one of the reasons why I have at the end of every chapter an action plan that actually is specifically targeted to different people is because I think wearing those hats, we each have a different, different responsibilities as well. Whether we're clinicians, it's really, you know, are we delivering the best outcomes? Do we actually even know the cost of what we're prescribing or what we're uh, doing? Because we are responsible. We're running the business. If we're um, payers, how are we holding clinicians accountable and our employees accountable for driving better health and lowering costs? And then, of course, if we're, we're policymakers, um, how could we accelerate um, and really push because we really need to accelerate right now that change? So I think there's a role for everybody. And based on what, what we're seeing with COVID and beyond COVID, um, there's no time like the present to really, to really move forward. So. I'm optimistic. I remain always very optimistic. So, um, and I appreciate the time. And I should just say that I do have a web page. If you, if I didn't get to a question, just feel free to reach out to me on the website. I'm happy to follow up with any, any questions or have questions. Well, thank you. That is very generous. And I, I know there are probably some that will because we didn't get to all the wonderful questions. Again, thank you all for, for joining us in this conversation. I do hope you'll come back next week for, for another uh, Friday at 11 in our series. And um, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you.